All right, hello Fellowship Baptist Church. Uh, we are uh, excited to be able to come and finish up our uh, lecture on the life of Martin Luther. As far as church history is concerned, I hope you guys have really enjoyed uh, the lectures. We're excited to be able to finish this one up and then to also go into the future and make some other uh, videos uh, just like this to kind of uh, span the tide through some more church history and see some very important uh, people and some important dates uh, that, that really show to us the, the foundation uh, that we stand upon as, as part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so with all that being said, we're just going to jump back in uh, here in this video and finish learning about Martin Luther. Uh, so b before we pick up where we left off, just to bring us back up to speed, uh, Martin Luther arguably was uh, and is one of the most important people uh, in the Reformation. Uh, without uh, contention, he is the one that actually began, sparks uh, the Reformation through certain actions. Uh, he's rivaled really in popularity only with John Calvin as, as far as, again, popularity of reformers is, is concerned. Um, he was born in the year 1483 and joins a monastery in 1505 and uh, actually is ordained into the priesthood in the Catholic Church in the year 1507. He has no peace of soul, uh, just inflicts incredible amounts of uh, injury upon himself, trying to make an atonement and suffer for his, for his own sins, never finding really any, any sort of uh, relief through all of those uh, different processes. Uh, eventually, uh, through uh, just dedicated study of the scriptures, begins to understand that justification is an act of God declaring a sinner righteous rather than an infusion of righteousness that takes place over a period of time by works. And, and so Luther begins grasping that. He eventually comes to full terms with the gospel of the grace of God that we're saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves, that it's the gift of God, and not of works, lest any man uh, should boast. And, and really, Luther comes to that great realization while he himself was lecturing through both the book of Galatians and the book of Psalms. It's very, very interesting. Uh, so, so Luther gets a big grip on this and, and really begins taking a, a more of a public stand uh, for the... Uh, truth of the gospel, the foundation, really, of the gospel. Well, later on, a man by the name of Johann Tetzel is going to be sent uh, to Saxony. He's going to come into Wittenberg, and he's going to be selling uh, indulgences. And this is going to completely infuriate uh, Luther, who wants to launch uh, not so much as, as an attack as to have an inner church debate. And so, now, Luther responds to Johann Tetzel's selling indulgences by going back home and writing out 95 reasons why the selling of indulgences was wrong, or indulgences in, in general are wrong. And so Luther takes that document of 95 reasons and he nails it to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. And again, Luther was just in, intending that to be an, an inner church uh, debate. And of course, it blows up and the rest becomes history. That's the 95 thesis that, that Luther nails to the door and it sparks uh, the Reformation. It starts gaining the attention of, of the Pope and, and different ones uh, around. Uh, eventually, uh, Luther is going to have a famous debate uh, with uh, Johann Eck. And uh, in, in having that debate, he's going to uh, affirm his... Uh, appreciation and agreement uh, with, uh, with John Huss, who was known as a heretic, was executed as a heretic. And so uh, Ick believes, of course, that, that he's kind of won the debate at that point in time. Uh, and, and so you could argue, argue, argue <laughs> you could argue either side uh, of that. But uh, what happens is that because really a, a lot to do with that debate and the outcome of it, uh, Luther is excommunicated from the church. He becomes a, a wanted man uh, of sorts. Uh, goes through all of, uh, all of that for a good period of time. He actually is uh, summoned to appear um, in, before uh, the Diet of Worms 
uh, where uh, the Diet, of course, the Imperial Council uh, to give a response. Uh, and so he's going to go there and he's going he's to give that. Uh, he, he does all of that. He's not going to recant uh, what he believes. And so uh, eventually Luther is going to, uh, on, his, on his way home from that council meeting, he's actually going to be kidnapped by friendly forces. Remember Frederick, uh, Prince Frederick uh, III, a very powerful prince in the Roman Empire, uh, has him abducted <laughs> and uh, takes him back to the Wartburg uh, Castle and kind of puts him in hiding for the next year. Uh, he takes upon himself, uh, Luther does, a, a pseudonym, Junker George, uh, which is Junker George, Squire George uh, in, in English. And so uh, Luther's going to stay there for about a year in, in kind of hiding out for safety in, in his life. Uh, while he's there, he's translating the scriptures, uh, the, the Greek New Testament into German, the, the commitment, the ready commitment of really all the reformers to get the word of God in the hands of, of common people, making it readily accessible uh, for individuals. So just uh, very, very neat as far as uh, all of that is, uh, is concerned. So you have uh, all of that uh, really taking place. Um, Luther's, uh, Luther's going to come out of hiding. He's going to return to Wittenberg. Uh, when he comes back into, back into Wittenberg, several of his colleagues have attempted to carry on the work of Reformation in his absence. Uh, one, one man kind of headed up that operation, a man by the name of, of, uh, of Andreas uh, Karlstadt. And uh, Karlstadt's methods were a lot different than Luther's. He, he was wanting to move at a lot faster pace, and he was willing to become a lot more forceful with what he was doing. And Luther, didn't, Luther didn't like that. Uh, it it kind of made a lot of unrest there in the city. And so Luther comes back and he kind of brings order back to everything that's going on, uh, a kind of a, a, a serene calmness uh, to everything. He runs Karlstadt and the other colleagues uh, out of town for what they were doing, causing the unrest there in, in the city. And so things find a, a lot more peaceful of a, of a situation there. Uh, and so Luther's very, very excited uh, about that. He's excited about the, the ground that, that has been covered. You know, his his thought process was the, the transition needed to move very slowly. And, and the reason for that is he wanted it to, to be correct. He didn't want to, you know, a lot of times when you're, when you're changing from one thing to another, you have a tendency to run out of this ditch and run straight across the road and fall into the other ditch. And, and Luther didn't want to do that. He wanted to, he wanted to be correct. And so he, he moved slowly. And he, and he wanted it to be thorough. He wanted it to be as well received as it possibly could and so he just he just kind of took his time uh through through all of that and um and did a tremendous job really um uh, well as in, in addition to recovering the fundamental truths of the gospel and what the church of jesus christ is really supposed to look like and the government and all those kinds of things you, you have another another recovery uh, in the life of Luther, and that is Luther, Martin Luther, uh, actually gets married, which doesn't sound that incredible to us, but you, you have to understand that from there in the 16th century, dating all the way back to the 11th century, uh, you had the reforms of Gregory the, the Seventh, called the Gregorian Reform, and what that reform mandated was absolute celibacy of clergy members. Uh, if you were in the ministry, you were forbidden to be married. And so for five centuries, uh, at least, of the church, you have no pastor and pastor's family or no clergy member with clergy family. Uh, all of that's been, been erased and it's been, it's been outlawed. And so when, when Luther gets married, there's not only been the recovery of fundamental truths and, and doctrines, theology, but, but there's also a recovery of now, now we have a pastor and we have a pastor's wife and we have a pastor's family, which fits perfectly into the context of 1 Timothy chapter number 3. So, uh, so he's married. Uh, he actually marries, uh, gets married on June 13th, 1525 to Katharina von Bora, uh, Katie for short. Uh, Katie had actually been rescued by Luther earlier uh, from a convent, from a nunnery. And so uh, they have... Uh, decided and committed their love 
uh, one to another. Uh, again, uh, another interesting fact about Luther's marriage here is that he had stated on several occasions that he would never get married. And it's not that he was against marriage or, or didn't have a desire to be married, but Luther understood that he was a wanted man and, and stood a high probability of being executed at any point in time. And so in Luther's mind, it wasn't fair to, to marry someone and then to be executed and what danger he might be putting his wife or his family in. And so he had said on several occasions that he would never get married. And so the mere fact that Luther has decided to get married shows you uh, the, the, the peace, really, that's, that's not only in his life, but is being found around him, that, that the Reformation is, at least there in, in Wittenberg and the surrounding communities, is starting to take root. People are, are more comfortable uh, with, with really what's uh, taken place. And so it shows somewhat of the, uh, of the success that he was having. Uh, through, through God's uh, power and, and providence. Uh, they, they actually move into, uh, he and his wife move into the monastery uh, there in Wittenberg uh, because now because of the Reformation, the um, monastery isn't needed uh, anymore. And so uh, Prince Frederick uh, allows Luther and his wife to just move in there. So they have this huge place that they use uh, really to house all kinds of, of uh, you know, preachers and different things. And I mean, it's just, uh, it's just an awesome opportunity uh, for when this, in the same year that Luther gets married, there's a, a group of radicals and they're, they're termed Anabaptists. Now uh, we're going to talk about Anabaptists later on. And um, that's uh, the, the term Anabaptist uh, has positive connotations to it and negative connotations. Um, Anabaptist, and again, we're going to talk about this uh, later on, uh, because of the stigma surrounding what true Anabaptists were and their viewpoint as uh, they're, they're being viewed as radicals, it starts to catch on that anyone that's any sort of an extremist or a radical in, in any situation becomes labeled an Anabaptist. It doesn't mean that they uh, necessarily believed or agreed or were genuine believers or anything like that. And so uh, in, a, in a lot of cases you have these political radicals, which is what is going to take place in the year of Luther's marriage uh, here. You have political radicals who are labeled as Anabaptists and they are very frustrated about the economic situation and the, the government's treatment, uh, kind of oppression of common people more uh, likely to be poor people, and so they are inciting uh, a revolt, really, a, against uh, against the government. And so, so they're coming into Wittenberg, and they're trying to really rile up all the people, all the all the citizens. And and Luther's response to that was really twofold. Again, uh, he he definitely sympathized with with the common people. He, he didn't want to see them uh, oppressed. He, he didn't want to see them suffering. But at the same time, uh, as a believer, he has a commitment to the Word of God. And the Word of God teaches us in Romans chapter number 13 that we are to obey civil government. And so uh, Luther said, hey, look, yeah, this is bad. And, and I don't like the fact that, that folks are suffering. And, but, but we have uh, a, a commitment and allegiance to the Lord to obey every single one of his commands. And, and part of that, uh, of course, is the supporting and the... Uh, uh, or really uh, obedience to the, the laws of the land towards uh, government. Well, uh, really about two years into uh, Luther and Katie's marriage, Luther's health is going to begin to decline pretty rapidly to the point that uh, Luther thinks again that he's, uh, that he's a dying man. Uh, most historians agree that the, the reason for Luther's failing health is uh, or dates all the way back to the earlier years in the monastery where he's just inflicting so much damage, uh, injuring himself, the, the long extended periods of repetitive uh, fasting and things like that. And so uh, it, it's believed that, that Luther suffers from some sort of gastrointestinal illness uh, really through the, the rest of his life. And what that illness is going to do is it's, it's really going to take a toll on his mental strength as well as his spiritual strength at point in times. And so he's going to experience uh, intermittent periods of melancholy and, and really depression uh, through, a, through 
much of the, of the rest of his life and uh, just, just really struggling uh, with all of that. And there's actually kind of a, a humorous uh, story in, in the middle of, of all of that, if you can, if you can look at it that way. Uh, when, when Luther's in the middle of one of those uh, states of melancholy, he's just kind of moping around and, you know, just woe is me and all that kind of stuff. Uh, his wife, Katie, goes and dresses up for uh, a funeral. She puts on a, an outfit that you would wear to a funeral. And so she's walking around the house, and Luther notices her, and she, he asks her, you know, what are you doing? Why are you, why are you dressed like that? And she says, well, I'm, I'm going to a funeral. And uh, Luther says, oh, well, who, well, who died? I, I, did, I didn't know we were going to a funeral. Who, who died? And so Katie looks at him, just somber, and replies, well, she said, well, God did. God died. And Luther, like, you know, perks up, like, what are you, ta- what are you talking about? And, uh, and she says, yeah, God, God died. And he's like, oh, yeah, you know, and, and he just, like, jumps up, and he's, like, so infuriated with, the, you know, how can you speak blasphemy like that? God's obviously not dead. He's, you know, he ever lives and, and, uh, and, and all of that. And to which Katie responds, oh, well, I, I didn't know. I figured God must be dead the way that you're walking around the house and, uh, and, and whimpering around. And so that kind of, Luther picked up on what she was doing and it kind of snapped him out of that state of, of melancholy. And so uh, good to have, uh, I, I guess, a, a wife like that, that that'll help you uh, recover when, when you're thinking, what was me uh, in life? Well, during such an episode in Luther's life uh, is, is when he actually pinned down the words uh, to the, the hymn we sang last Wednesday night, uh, A Mighty Fortress is Our God a bulwark, never failing. Uh, he was actually studying and lecturing through uh, Psalm 46 and, and just pins that down, showing his confidence and his resilience uh, was really, really just placed uh, in, in the Lord. And so uh, just, just really neat. In, in fact, one of the things that we learn in, in the life of Luther is, is that his, his personality is not really bent towards courageousness. Uh, one of the things that you pick up on as you, as you read through his life is, is he was a man naturally of nerves and fear. Uh, remember back earlier on in his life, and he gets in a thunderstorm and he thinks he's going to die to the point that he promises to enter a monastery if his life is preserved. Uh, he, he gets sick and starts having stomach troubles and immediately what's the first thing he thinks about? He thinks I'm going to die. Uh, he's, he's suffering in that sense, and so he goes into states of melancholy and, and depression. He was, he was really more of a, I think, a, a very timid and, and nervous kind of, kind of guy. But you don't see that in the Reformation. You, you don't see that in his stance upon the truth of the Word of God. And, and the reason for that doesn't lie in Luther himself, but, but it lies in his confidence in, in Scripture and in the God of Scripture. Uh, Luther believed that, that the Word of God was sufficient and that, and that God himself was all-powerful. And so he had absolute confidence in the Bible and in the Lord and really zero confidence uh, in himself. And that's why he could take such a bold stand for the truths of the Word of God and for the Lord himself. Uh, and so just, just real neat. And, and then, by the way, before we start to draw down to a conclusion here, uh, the, the same year... Um, that his health started failing two years into his marriage is when black death hit uh, the plague and you have all of this panic you have all of these people dying you have all of these people evacuating and trying to get into quarantine areas and all of this kind of stuff and luther and his wife resolve that they're going to stay put they want to stay and remain uh, readily accessible to anyone that might need the help of the minister of god and uh, just, just another testament to his confidence in the Lord, in his, in his safekeeping, and in his, uh, in his providence. Uh, towards the latter years of Luther's life, he remains committed to Christian and, and Bible education. Uh, but, but one of the questions that, that really uh, arises is this, how, how do you educate uneducated people? And most of the individuals of that day were uneducated. And so how do you, how do you educate them? And Luther, Luther had, uh, had, had two answers uh, to that. Uh, hymns, you educate them through hymns and you educate them through catechism. And so Luther used both of, of those means 
to educate the uneducated. Uh, hymns, uh, especially in that day, and, and we're seeing a re recovery of that in, in our day, uh, hymns were a way to convey truth and doctrine. It wasn't just a, a way to incite uh, emotion. Um, we're not anti-emotion, but, but we are anti just going after uh, the emotions. And so uh, hymns uh, for, for Luther were, were a way to, to teach uh, doctrine. They're, they're a way to draw attention to the glory of God and, and to present the truth of who God is. Um, and so Luther used that, and then he also wrote a shorter and a larger catechism. And, and of course, here at Fellowship, we understand what a catechism is. It's a, it's a question-answer way of learning. You ask the question, you pose the question, and then you give the answer, and then you give a wealth of Scripture to support uh, the answer to that actual question. Luther also has, with some of the more educated folks, uh, what became known as uh, table talk. Uh, if you're uh, familiar with Legionnaire, uh, Legionnaire Ministries, uh, with their table talks. This is where it originated from with the, the table talks of Luther. And what Luther would do is, is he would sit around with his students and with fellow pastors and they would have these discussions on theology and, and, and various doctrines uh, for, for really lengthy periods of time. And they, um, it was just a great time of, of learning and conveying uh, wisdom. You know, uh, you have, you know, as iron sharpeneth iron. And so they're, they're sharpening the countenance of, of one another. By the year 1534, uh, Luther, along with uh, certain colleagues, actually finished translating the entire Bible from the original languages into, uh, into German. Uh, again, just showing that tremendous interest in making sure that common people have the Bible in their language, and so it is very accessible uh, for them. Well, Luther also... Uh, as he, as he grows older and really closer to death, is going to become a lot more intolerant uh, of, of certain folks. And some of it's justifiable, and then some of it's not uh, justifiable. And what we have to keep in mind here is, is Luther is a, is a man, just like you and I. Uh, he is a, a sinner, and the, the wonder of it all is that God uses men like Luther and people like you and I in spite of of our sinfulness and our failures and our mistakes. And so uh, Luther gets a lot more, um, uh, you could say, uh, brutal <laughs> towards the Pope. Uh, but, but he also changes in his attitude towards the Jews. Earlier on, uh, Luther had sought to convert the Jews. But, but in the latter years of his life, he, he really got very hostile uh, towards the Jews and, and just blamed them a lot for what happened to, uh, to the Lord. And so he, again, he just has this kind of bad feeling towards them. That's very wrong. And there were some other things. Luther wasn't right in everything that he believed and everything that he wrote down. Uh, again, uh, God, God can draw a straight line with a crooked stick. And so uh, we, we praise the Lord for the things that God did use uh, this, uh, this incredible man to, uh, to accomplish. So, uh, and, and just to mention, uh, that uh, again, I know we did the other night, but Luther is and was a far cry from what Lutherans are uh, are today, and so the, the two really don't uh, are not synonymous uh, at all right now. As far as his death, uh, Luther preached his last sermon on February uh, in the month of February 1546. Again, in isolated in the, the city of his birth. And it's, again, ironic because he doesn't spend any time. He leaves there when he's two years old. And he, he really just comes back into town to help take care of some, of some family issues, some family matters. And while he's there, he, he falls sick and he dies on February 18th uh, as a 62-year-old man. Um, Luther was an incredible man that God used in incredible ways. And uh, we're, we're thankful for the influence that, that he had as well as uh, other men and for the refinement of those doctrines that brings us down to where we are right now, yeah, uh, you know, uh, the present part of church history. And we owe a great deal of gratitude to those men and women who have gone before us and blazed the trail with, with gospel ministry. So praise the Lord for that. Well, I hope you've enjoyed learning about Martin Luther and we'll continue into... Uh, the future, I'm making some uh, other videos 
uh, some lectures put together learning about other men and other significant events about church history. Fellowship, I hope you have a, a lovely day today. Uh, may the Lord bless you and uh, look, look forward to serving the Lord with you uh, for a long time. Praise God.